move me back. Yeah. So I'd like to turn to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Last week afterwards somebody came up to me and said was telling me what they got out of the message on creation's groaning. And he said, very seriously, I, I got, uh, what I remember from your message is that Jeffrey talks to dogs. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Uh, so the verse this morning at, at the breaking of bread time was in Colossians 3, 16 and 17. And in there, it also mentions to allow the word of the Christ to dwell in us richly and, and um, some other things. But this concept of the, the word of the Christ dwelling richly has been my prayer for the last day for our time. And um, yesterday I was uh, pacing around and meditating through the time. And um, I had planned on sharing as well today about the cherubim and about the new Jerusalem in talking about the new creation. And there's some really neat things there. But yesterday I had a, a time, such a time that um, I had to take a break and was overwhelmed. I told my wife I was revelified instead of edified. This the, the, the revelation about the new creation. And so I'm gonna talk about a little bit less in, in uh, nerdy details. Um, but I think the, the real need for today's time is to allow the stuff that we focus on to dwell in our hearts richly. Uh, so I mention that just because usually when someone is sharing the first, especially two messages in a row, the first 10 minutes may be a recap. So you tune out at first. And they maybe even talk in more of a monotone voice at first. And then somewhere in there, it gets a little more exciting. But then eventually they're kind of building up to something. But I'd like to skip some of that this time and just, just get into some exciting stuff, hopefully. Um, I, I did pass out a, a chart. It says copyrighted, but it was a long copyright time, so it's public domain now. And this guy, Larkin's uh, drawings are interesting, and some of them are a little bit crazy. Um, this one, I think, is wonderful. So I, I wanted to pass it out with some of the stuff that we're talking about today. So it is okay this time with the chart to go ahead and have skimmed it. <clears throat> Last time I passed out a chart, I, I uh, uh, asked people not to look at it, and they still did, and they told me how it affected their conscience. Um, so <laughs> this is completely okay uh, to cheat. We're going to use this just slightly, um, but mainly we're going to be using some verses. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, So if anyone be in Christ, there is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And just a little bit in verse 18, it says, and all things are of the God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And then there's another verse in Galatians chapter six. Verse 14 and 15. So Galatians chapter six, verse 14 and 15. But far be it from me to boast, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world was crucified to me, and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but new creation. And let's pray together. Lord, we pray our hearts can be very open to you today, even that we would be caught up into the things of God and away from the things of the earth. Pray you bless this time with your light and with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if anyone's in Christ, there's a new creation. This is the translation that I'm reading from. And the there is is in brackets in the Darby translation. In other translations, that's replaced with different things. Um, so very technically, it says, if anyone is in Christ, and then there's this, like, pause or this, the guy forgot to put in some words, experience. They just says, new creation. If anyone's in Christ, new creation. Um, like as if English was a second language to the Apostle Paul. Now, of course, he's writing in Greek. So, um, 
But it sounds strange, so we fill it in with other things. But it's larger than what we can fill it in with. That's why I wanted to bring it up. I like to say there is a new creation. I think this is good. Some translations will say he is a new tr- creation, and I think this is true. So if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. You're a new creature, part of the new creation. But technically, if anyone's in Christ, suddenly they're in this realm of the new creation. There is a new creation, and it's all found inside of Christ. Um, there's a new, uh, a new start, a new beginning, and a new finality. Uh, so to talk about the new creation in the spiritual realm of it, I think first it would help us to look at it physically with the physical new creation that's about to be, which is why I brought this uh, chart here and I wanted to start off in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about a new heavens and a new earth. So there, there are a number of things on this chart I, I don't want to use. I think they're neat, but, and they might help explain away some terms that you'll find like the, um, the old world is different than the then world. And the, the age to come, talking about the kingdom age, is different than when we're talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, so this has some of those terms on there. But if you look at it in a broader way, it's talking about 1 Peter chapter 3. It's using that, this section in 1 Peter chapter 3 to show you these three um, stages of the earth, three major stages that has, the earth has undergone or it will be in the future. Uh, I'm sorry, I said 1 Peter, I meant 2 Peter, my bad. 2 uh, Peter chapter 3. Now what was happening here that he talks about is people mocking the coming of the Lord Jesus. Uh, they, they say, if you look at verse uh, 4, they say, where is the promise of his coming? It's just like it was in the past, and nothing has ever changed. Since, since creation, things have been like this. And he says, it's from their own willful, willfulness that they're deceived, and they don't realize things have not always been the same. That, and so here in verse uh, 5, this is hidden from them through their own willfulness. Like I said, the heavens were of old. So this is the heavens were of old. This is a term, old heavens. And an earth having its substance out of water and in water by the word of God, through which the waters, the then world, was deluged with water and it perished. So here's, here's a, a phrase here. Heavens of old and the then world. Heavens and earth, but the heavens were of old, and that world back then had become deluged in water, had become immersed in water. And the earth now came out from that water in his descriptions. In verse 7 it says, But the present heavens and the earth by his word are laid up in store, kept for fire unto, unto a day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But let not this one thing be hidden from you, beloved, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord does not delay his promise as some account of delay, but is long-suffering towards you. He's not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a rushing noise, and the elements burning with heat shall be dissolved. And the earth and the works in it shall be burnt up, And these things then being to be dissolved, what ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, by reason of which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements burning with heat shall melt. But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. So here we have the present heavens and the present earth as well. This is what is happening currently. Um, And it says that they are waiting for a time of fire where all the elements, all of the things in them will be completely burnt up. So there's a time period when this earth, this rock of earth, and all that's out there in the whole universe will be purified by fire. Just like in the past, all things were, um, in the the old, the, the earth actually was covered over with water. In the future, the earth will be purified by fire. And I mentioned last week about the, the groaning of creation. At some point, a third of the plants or grass is all burnt up. But at this time, everything's really burnt up. Everything is dealt with. So even now, he, he mentions later on about 
If this is going to happen, how should we live right now? What should we be about? You get some tangible thing from the earth. How do you, how do you look at it? Uh, even in our happiness for uh, things that are going on right now, there should be a hint of, this is going to burn. There should be a hint of, I'm looking for and hoping for the new heavens and the new earth. I'm living in this time of the new creation. And these things even though I finally got my grass to all be grass and all those potholes are filled in and the dog finally learned to dig in just the back corner, we got this perfect. There still should be a hint on the believer's heart of like, well, thank God, but it's going to all burn. You know, I, I finally got just the right furniture to match the room the way I wanted it to look. There should still be the hint of flavor upon us like, I know it's going to burn, you know. I know this isn't going to last long. I finally got the newest phone, even though I can't wait two more months later when the next new phone comes and I'll trade mine in. <laughs> it should still be, you know, it's going to burn. How do we live? If there's a waiting for the coming of the Lord, pointing us to the new creation in the end, and there's a longing for it, and he even uses the term in, in Second Peter, a hastening or a, a making it faster. So there's, a, there's that kind of lifestyle for a Christian. So looking at it physically, though, from this, uh, the, the new heavens and the new earth technically, physically happen at the time after the thousand years, after the millennial kingdom. So if you look on this chart, the great big circle is talking about the present earth in the middle. And then it does mention the time uh, before the flood, and it does mention the time when the Lord returns and brings in the kingdom, because uh, these were very major marks uh, upon the earth and major changes. Like I mentioned last week, after the flood, we began to have rain and storms and things like this. Uh, before that, because of sin, the earth began to be very corrupted. Uh, morally, uh, with mankind, uh, after the flood, physically, mankind not only died, but they died a lot faster. Uh, animals uh, began to not just eat plants, but they began to eat each other and eat people. And even after the flood, God said, our bodies need the meat of some animals. So he, he made it appropriate to, to eat meat. Um, so things changed uh, after the flood. And also in the future, in the kingdom age, things will be very different than now. Uh, the animals will be peaceful again. The animals won't be eating each other or us. Mankind will live a lot longer. Uh, it'll be rare for someone to die so young as 100 years old. You know, Brother Kong would be a kid, you know, in that age, as far as the time of lifespan. Uh, so, so these things are different. This is the present earth. Now, uh, at, the, at the very end of this, many things are judged by fire. The church is judged first by fire. If you look in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, um, later on or, or whatever, there's a judgment seat of Christ mentioned there. It's a judgment experience for Christians, and it talks about how they're judged according to their works, and it's judged by fire. Even if your works are bad as a Christian, you will be saved, but so as through fire. But all of your works are burnt up, and you suffer loss, and you miss out on the reward which would be that thousand years. So there's a fire judgment experience for even for Christians. Um, even on the judgment side of it for Christians in the book of Hebrews when he talks about uh, warning them for the judgment coming, he mentions fire. And in Revelation uh, 2 and 3, one of the things for the overcomer's reward is that they don't taste of that lake of fire. They don't taste of the second death. They don't have that fire experience like that. Um, so the church is judged by fire, and if you look at it towards the end times, uh, fire comes up a few times. Uh, actually, when the sheep and the goat nations are gathered before the Lord, uh, the ones that, that um, didn't do well during the tribulation, uh, they go straight to the lake of fire. And then when, when the when the Antichrist and the prophet are taken by the Lord when he had landed on the earth, uh, he put them right directly alive into the lake of fire. 
And then after the thousand years, at the very end of the thousand years, when Satan is released for a short time from that deep abyss that he was locked up in, Satan is let go and he gathers multitudes of people on the earth to rebel against God and they all come against his city. And, and uh, this is in Revelation 20. And then they, God burns them all up. All the people get burned by fire and they all die. All the ones that gather. And Satan himself is thrown into the lake of fire. And then uh, those people and all the other dead, uh, all of the other dead, are brought before the great white judgment throne. And everyone not found in the book of life is judged, is condemned there to go to the lake of fire, it says, in Revelation chapter 20. Now, this, all of this fire experiences brings you up to the, the next spot where now fire goes through everything of creation. Now all is purified physically, and it brings you to Revelation chapter 21, which also mentions the new heavens and the new, new earth. Uh, you can turn there if you want to. Uh, if you're interested in the new creation or the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, these are our chapters to look at in Revelation 21 and 22. I just want to mention the first verse, though. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw it. So this is, remember, this is right after the last of all people, the last of all beings are judged. Morally, everything is dealt with. Even Hades itself, in Revelation 20, the place of the dead is thrown away into the lake of fire. So there's no more dying after that. There's no more, no more moral corruption and no more sin, no more temptation for it. Everyone has made their choice at this point. So he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea exists no more. So this brings you chronologically to the time period when it's finally there. The final new creation. All things have become new. All the old have passed away completely. Morally, everything is right. Uh, physically, everything is right. Everything is pure. Uh, spiritually, everything is pure. All the spiritual beings that had rebelled, they all are judged and dealt with and locked up forever or in the fire. Uh, like it mentions that the lake of fire is built for the devil and his angels. Um, so th so this, is, this is where everyone's at. In time, this is the new creation. And this is something hoped for. Even during the kingdom age, there's still a hint of almost, almost. All the believers aren't there yet. Almost, though. All creation isn't perfect yet. Almost, though. All sin hasn't totally been dealt with, but it's almost there. Things are restored very well, but not to its perfection. Then comes the new heavens and the new earth. So this is in time. But then we read the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17, which caught me off guard, even though I think I memorized this when I first got saved. It caught me off guard a lot yesterday. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. And the new creation has already started in Christ. So in time physically, things are going to happen over a thousand years from now. New heavens, new earth, new creation. But how does creation happen with God's style? With the creator's way of creating, how does he do it? Last week we mentioned a little bit of how he does it. When, when God creates, he has his way of creating because it's to do with his purpose of creation. So we mentioned a few places that talk about this. Of course, Genesis 1-1 say that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But how did he do it? And the way that he did it, it mentions it in John chapter 1. One of the things it mentions is that by the word, which, which is Christ, um, everything that he created, everything that has been, it says. That's the, my translation, that's the way it mentions it. All things that have been came into being by him, by Christ. So there's not one thing that has come into being that did not come into being by this word. Uh, and later on it says, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of grace and truth. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. So by Christ, all the, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, all this happened. And it's not only there, it's in some other places. In Colossians chapter one, it mentions this as well. And it says that he is the, the, he's the, the firstborn of creation, but he, he, all things were created by him. It says, and all things were created for him. So when, whatever came to be created of the universe, the, the, 
the way it started, uh, the place that matter came from, was from within Christ. And the reason for that, and God's reasoning for that, is, is in his final purpose for all of creation and time. And it's because he wants all of those things to uh, be manifesting Christ. He wants all of those things to not only be for Christ, he wants them to be summed up in Christ. He wants Christ to be everything, all in all. So in the final picture of the new creation, not only is all the evil things dealt with and all of the uh, impurities of all creation dealt with, but it's more than that. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Inside of this new creation, in the far future, everything is actually, has actually come from Christ directly. So we could at least say this is God's method of creation. He wants to create it from Christ, through Christ. In Hebrews 11, we mentioned last week that uh, the process of creating that God did, it tells us is a process of faith. It's the same similar experience we have with faith in the smaller matters. It also was the experience of how God created the worlds or the universe. When he, it says in, in Hebrews 11 that uh, faith is the bringing into substance or the substantiating of things hoped for. Uh, now, what we're hoping for is this new heavens and this new earth, this new creation. So faith is the bringing into substance, and it's also the conviction or the evidence or the proof of the things that are unseen. And then in verse 3, it tells how when we know by faith that this experience of faith happened when the worlds were created. If you look at Hebrews 11.3, we usually study the characters from Hebrews 11, even myself included, I always skipped over verse three, but to think about creation itself then the physical matter was created by faith. And so that way, the physical things that we see, don't ha they have their origin from the invisible, from the spiritual. They have their origin from Christ. So all that's actually real to us, that real uh, tree in your backyard, uh, the real ground that you stand on, the real people that you say hi to. The matter that all of this creation has come from, the physical part of it, has come from an invisible spiritual realm. And in that invisible spiritual realm, it all came from Christ himself. So when God is creating anything, this is how he does it. Even to bring us to see what's real is that invisible spiritual realm. What's more real? Uh, what's more real is what started all of what we think of as real. So the reason I wanted to look at the physical time of the new creation is because I think our mindset is more physical. Um, we're in physical bodies and we touch this earth so much and we can study the earth and can study God's creation. And so we can even study it to the point where we think, if I'm going to discover God, I need to find him with the physical things and, because that's what I can study. But what we're missing in that understanding is that the physical came from another whole realm, uh, a spiritual realm. The physical came from the invisible. Even in our, in our pursuit of philosophy and science, we discover some things of God's creation, like nothing comes from nothing. Everything has an origin. Uh, so if we trace all this physical creation back, it has to start from something that's not physical. And what it started that's not physical is from the eternal God who never had a beginning. Someone, something has to have never started um, to start anything because uh, nothing comes from nothing. All right, so this is, this is our new creation experience. But if anyone's in Christ, there's already a new creation. Remember that God starts with Christ in doing his creation. So don't just think of our present world. Let's think about not only our present world, but the future world to come, the new creation, and watch one of them is currently decreasing and the other one is currently increasing. Since almost 2,000 years ago, at the cross, the old creation was done away with and the new creation had its first beginning. Now, how can this happen? This happened in that spiritual realm where God does his creating actions. So long ago, the new creation that we're going to physically see, that's going to have a look and have a tangibleness to it, it actually had its beginning at the cross of Christ. He took the old creation with him. And so it says in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ, there's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now remember what we just read in Revelation 21.1. 1. 
It says, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. The old heavens and the old earth had passed away, it says, and the sea exists no more. The old heavens and the old earth have passed away. At this point, over 1,000 years in the future. But back at the cross, all the old things have passed away. If anyone's in Christ, there's a new creation. The old things have passed away. So that final experience in the physical realm has already happened in the spiritual realm at the cross of Christ. He took all of the... All of the uh, reality of the old creation and brought it in through this process of the cross. And the whole way of creating the new creation is constantly the same exact thing. So try to follow me in your minds. If you can see, we're in the present world, but at this moment in time, 2,000 years ago at the cross, the beginning of the end of the old creation starts. The beginning of that final fire happens right there at the cross. And the beginning of that final beauty of the new creation happens right there at the cross. Now, at that time period, the old creation is very large. It's huge. And the new creation is just beginning. He's actually the first of the creation. He's the, the firstborn of the new creation. He's the very beginning of this new creation himself. It's not just by him things were created, but now it's different. He himself enters into the new creation individually. Now, of course, with the expanded, expanse of Christ and his resurrection and his ability to release his life, he begins to bring all of creation into himself, into Christ. So it starts with the apostles, uh, the uh, disciples in the beginning who believed on Christ. They all, when they saw him and his resurrection, then they believed. He breathed on them and said, receive eternal life. These ones found themselves in Christ from there on. And ever since that time, there have been believers that are found in Christ. Everyone who's born again is in Christ. So, uh, so remember this, this, this largeness of the old creation. For that believer, at that spot of believing in Christ, the new creation inside of them begins to take, take place. They begin to be brought into the realm of the new creation. And not only that, but the cross begins to work on the realm of the old creation inside of them. And it, this happens both in, in the fact, but also in the experience of us. Uh, now, somewhere away and learning about abiding this week in, in, a, in a Canada. And, of course, it comes up with abiding that we have our place in Christ, and then we have our, our like, living there, our abode, or our, we're, we're about him right now. It's the same with this new creation. If anyone's in Christ, technically... They're already in the realm of the new creation, no matter what. You can't jump out of it. Um, but you're also in the realm of the old creation. We're in these bodies that are not yet redeemed. We are also uh, experiencing the old man nature inside of us. Uh, and so I'm in Adam, and I'm in Christ right now. Uh, now that old creation, uh, morally speaking, spiritually speaking, we would call it uh, with us the old man Adam, um, but that old creation should be, in my experience, decreasing. And then the new creation, the, the new life of Christ, should be increasing. This should be our experience. But it kind of hinges on your current, right now, uh, abiding or not abiding. Uh, so I would also apply this verse, of uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, to an experience. Not just a fact. Because right before it he says, we don't need to know each other according to the flesh. Even we knew Christ physically, some did, but now they know him differently. And with us believers, we know each other spiritually. Now, knowing each other according to the flesh is easy for us when we run into each other's flesh, right? Uh, but there's a, an eyelid of forgiveness upon us, and we close our eyes and suddenly open them up, and forgiveness has shattered the old creation viewpoint that we used to see that person. And now when we look at them, we see, if anyone's in Christ, there's a new creation. This person is a new creature. So that said, the experience of the new creation is an experience that can happen right now with abiding in Christ, with living in the new creation. So have we found ourselves in Christ? Uh, now there's the in and there's the ofness of a Christian. Um, like the Lord Jesus said how when he prayed for us in, in, uh, in John 17, 
He prayed for us not to be out of the world. He would leave us in the world, but he prayed for us and said that we're not of the world. We're not of the world. And it's the same with Christ. You're in Christ, and then there's the being of Christ. And that's, that comes down to, I'm cast on him, I'm walking with him, I'm enjoying Christ, I'm of Christ. I'm not just in the family, but I'm living in the home. And I'm with the family, and I'm doing the things together. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our current experience of the new creation. Now, what, what I think I saw yesterday was everything, everything that makes it to the new creation is inside of Christ. Um, I saw the rocks, the stars, and the universe. All of it squeezes through that cross and is in the new creation because of Christ. Nothing can be there that's not of Christ. He actually literally, physically, not only spiritually, is everything in the very end. He actually, not saying you lose yourself, but you shine Christ. And the trees shine Christ. And the rocks shine Christ. And a brother afterwards last time reminded me of a verse uh, that, that shows the... Um, it shows some of these things of creation actually having a voice and talking and worshiping God and the trees and so on. And he shared it with tears with me. And uh, I really, I really, amen. I don't know what it looks like. And I, don't, I know now someone will say what they got out of this message is that Jeffrey thinks trees are going to talk to us too. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I may be crazy. But all I know is the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And when we sing it, now, if you watch the wind, the trees are doing this and some branches start to break and whatever. But maybe, at least spiritually, really, creation, all burned up and purified, and now it's only in Christ, maybe something is beyond what our imaginations are. Maybe the new creation is different than the staleness we give it. And uh, also, we can, we can enjoy it right now. The new creation has already started. The new creation, the new heavens and the new earth has already begun in Christ. This is, this is literal, this is real and tangible, spiritually tangible, that the new creation can be touched and enjoyed right now. The new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem can happen right now and it actually matches all of history of how God creates because in all history, the way God creates is through Christ. And he always wants it first to be spiritual and then physical. So right now, the creating process is happening, and we can speed it up or we can slow it down. We're actually part of the new creation and part of the experience of the createdness being happen happening. We're part of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem being built, being purified by fire. It's actually happening literally today. This is blowing me away. Just to see that when I'm experiencing the new creation deep inside and I'm abiding in Christ, I see all the old things are gone. Technically, right that moment when you're in Christ and you're experiencing Christ and you're abiding in Christ, all that old creation is gone. True, you're trapped in the, in the uh, clothing of your old creation body. True, you may five minutes later see a squirrel and be distracted. It's true that we are limited, but you can experience the new creation today. Um, so let's contemplate that just a little bit together. It's like, when, in the new creation, there's the new Jerusalem. Now, I, I'm not going to get into all of the details. I'm not going to have my new Jerusalem chart out today. Um, but some things that probably everybody remembers. The new Jerusalem shines clearly as a strange type of gold. So let's say we're experiencing the spiritual realness of the new creation right now. Someday physically, kind of physically and spiritually, it's a little bit complex, but there's this physical earth, physical new heavens, new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, and the new Jerusalem is there. People are coming to the gates. Kings of the earth are bringing their, their um, awesomeness to the gates or whatever they've got, and uh, no one comes in except that they're in the book of life through those gates, but they go out, and there's this tree of life, and then there's this river flowing, and the tree of life has not only one 
fruit, but 12 for each month of the year. And uh, the, tr- the leaves of this tree of life are used to heal up any of the humans out there that get hurt. It's for the healing of the Gentiles, it says. So if they break a leg or they are, anything is wrong, they can be healed by those leaves of the tree of life. This is something true in the future. But is it really true right now in that creating process of the new creation that's happening inside of us? I think it actually is literally spiritually happening right now. Uh, those that are abiding in Christ, they have a portion of the tree of life already. Now what's more real? To see the physical tree of life with the fruit 10 feet away from you and to know that that's the tree of life right there or to right now, any man in Christ experiencing the new creation, old things passed away, take of the spiritual fruit of the tree of life and live by the life of Christ. Live by eternal life. I think that's more real. And I think the reason God does physical after spiritual is because in his mind and his viewpoint, that is more real. And that is, the, that is what is solid in this universe, beyond this universe. So we take of the tree of life right now. The river of life with a believer, there is this life flowing inside of them. Um, even if you tap into it, into the life of Christ, it's not that you need to keep going to the well like in John 4, like the woman at the well. He said, if you, would, if you knew who you're talking to, if you believed, there would be this spring of water flowing out. And, and uh, many of us have probably experienced this. Even you've had a dry day, but then you're, um, you tap into Christ It's not that you spent an hour and you gained a good grace supply that you can just unload on somebody, but it's just that currently, right this moment, you're living by the life of Christ and the life of Christ is your drink and your flow and it even overflows, even without much of a history. But right now, that's your portion. And not only this, the tree of life and these, these walls of gold, remember the fire is purifying everything and even us, it says in uh I think it's in 1 Peter 1 about like precious faith purified like gold by fire. Um, this, is, this is what's happening to us. This, this kind of shining of materials is being so purified with the dealings of the cross. This is our cross fire happening that um, more and more it's just Christ shining out. More and more you can see through the wall and actually see what's inside the new Jerusalem. And what you see is a blinding light almost because the light of Christ shines for the whole place. But imagine these thick, tall walls that are see-through. And the reason they're see-through is because they've been so purified by fire that all you can see now when you look at that wall is Christ. There is a stone there or there is a piece of gold right there. But you can see through it because it just shines Christ. And it's the same experience with believers right now spiritually. I really believe the Lord... um, wants to create that new Jerusalem spiritually before he physically puts it together. He spiritually wants this to happen. So we will notice a believer more and more as they progress spiritually that they're shining Christ more and more. It's the whole John the Baptist, he must increase while I'm decreasing. It's the thing of spiritual growth. This is, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation is actually being built and it's actually happening right now. Uh, in the New Jerusalem, there are these really tall walls. And uh, not to say there's anybody really bad out there, but to say, like, even now, the wall experience of dwelling in the New Jerusalem for us is our portion. It's very tall, and there are specific gates to enter in, and there's only specific stuff allowed in. And in a believer's life, we need these kind of walls. We need these kind of barriers these barriers that, that the Lord puts up and has a filter, uh, you know, uh, the filter of these, um, of these, of these tribes, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, they just allow things that are of Christ, things that have eternal life into the city. And what comes out from them is just of Christ. Now here come these crazy verses in the Bible that tell us to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do all things, whether we're eating or drinking, to the glory of God. Whatever we say, let it be something that's pure and helpful and, and uh, nothing just common. This is, this is uh, out of this world, impossible types of encouragements or even you can take it as a command in the Bible. But it's normal in the New Jerusalem. Whatever goes out of that city is just shining Christ. And nothing can come in, nothing is put in except what belongs in that city. 
And these walls are not only to protect from outside in our current day, we would definitely say that, but it's also to um, bring that home feeling. The home stops here. And where is my house right now? So you're walking around on this earth. Like we were saying, you realize that everything is going to burn. Everything is not going to last forever. As we're walking around, uh, there's a togetherness of living in the new Jerusalem, though, deep inside. It's like, what do, I let, what do I let come into my heart? Just like in Proverbs, he says, um, guard your hearts. You know, and out of your heart is, the, is, is where life will come. But protect your hearts. Now, this comes down to relationships and time spent and things that your eyes watch and things that you're doing. This comes down to all of this. But what it, what it basically is, is if you're in Christ, there's a new creation. And all those old things have passed away. You're experiencing the new Jerusalem right now. Um, I, just, I just wanted to get up today and testify how amazing this is. And I don't have a lot of uh, really cool stuff to say, actually except something that I think has to be contemplated and has to be meditated on and has to let the word dwell richly in our hearts. And I can say for me, like, to know how real the new creation is currently compared to future, compared to just a future hope, but to know, like, right this moment, I'm in the new creation, and it's my experience. And I'm in Christ. I can stand up here and, by God's grace, say, I'm in Christ, those old things by the cross, I have been done away. I'm, uh, the world is crucified to me, and I'm crucified to the world. There's no circumcision, uncircumcision, no other background type of things. There's only new creation. This is all we got. Which realm are we living in right now? Where are you dwelling? In the new creation or in this failing, about to be burned creation of the old? Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you so much for bringing us all into the new creation. Even thank you that it's our portion today. Thank you, Lord, that you love us to the uttermost and save us to the completeness, and you give us the privilege over all creation to enter into this first and to pave the way for the rest of the world, to pave the way for all the animals and all the plants and all the things out there. Lord, I really take it as a privilege. We all, together as your people, can just be overwhelmed by the largeness of your purpose in creation, of the immensity of what you're doing out there and with us. We just worship you as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.